exalted leader. Thank you. Did I you appreciate like that? the kind words, yes. <laughs> I kind of made a little bit of a bet with Cook before I came up, and I, um, as she was going through uh, the introductory remarks, I said, you have to put in their exalted leader, and uh, she kind of chuckled and looked at me, and I was glad to see that she actually um, uh, took my advice at least this time. Um, being the competitive individual that I am, when I say good morning to everybody, I do want to do better than both Jeff as well as Cook. So um, I would appreciate your help in being able to do that. So good morning to everybody in the room. Here you go. Thank you so much. So I'm actually here today to talk about, uh, give you some updates in terms of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. This is an area that's dear and near to my heart. As Cook had mentioned, I've been here for about two and a half years now. And it's been a great experience for me. There's been a lot that I've learned and a lot that I've been able to contribute and hopefully continue to contribute as we move forward uh, with our quality initiatives. But I do want to give you a little update in terms of uh, where we are and the things that we've done in uh, 2017. So in terms of the outline, we're going to start out with some of our strategic priorities. We did put in place a five-year strategic plan. That strategic plan was put in place to give us the vision of where we want to go over the next five years. So out of that, we've built out our strategic priorities. Give you an idea of some of the organizational updates. We do have some development opportunities that are in there as well. We do like to develop the individuals within the organization. Within FDA, we are no different than what you would find in the industry. Uh, strengthening our collaborative, uh, collaborative organization, promoting availability of better medicines, which is one of our key missions going forward. Evaluate awareness and commitment to the importance of pharmaceutical quality. So we want to do more outreach. Uh, we're going to be going to different venues to be able to bring to the forefront pharmaceutical quality. Uh, we also want to strengthen our partnership and engage stakeholders on quality itself. And then just a few concluding remarks I'd like to share with you as well. So in terms of our strategic priorities, before I get into that, I wanted to share with you kind of our vision and mission of, for, for um, uh, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. It's our shared goal of assuring consistently safe and effective drugs uh, for patients as well as consumers. Um, as Cook had mentioned, my background is on the OTC side as well. I've worked in OTCs. I've worked on the RX side. I've done generic drugs. I've done device, uh, drug device combinations. I've worked on the device side as well. So I've seen it from different perspectives. So it really does give me a unique opportunity to bring those experiences into the FDA as we look at quality. So it's quality across all of the different areas that we work, not only in generics, but as well as in NDAs, as well as BA, uh, BLAs, the biologic side of the uh, uh, industry as well. So pharmaceutical quality is what gives patients and consumers confidence in their next dose. If you've uh, seen some of my uh, uh, previous presentations, one of the things or one of the ways I define quality is to call it the safety and efficacy of the next dose or assuring the safety and efficacy of the next dose. So when the consumer takes that tablet, takes that injection, they know that through quality, the safety and efficacy will be there when they get that next dose as well. So it's one of the ways to define quality, one of the ways I like to define it anyway. So our mission and vision are here. The mission is very simple, to assure that quality medicines are available to the American public. We serve the American public. We are public servants. That's our simple mission. Our vision is to be the global benchmark for regulation of pharmaceutical quality. It's not because we're arrogant that we state that, but it is our, um, uh, our vision going forward. We want to become the global benchmark. That, that, continues for, that pushes us to continue to strive for innovation, to do better, to be better, over time. And then our motto is One Quality Voice. This is something I'm very proud of. One Quality Voice, what does that mean? It has two meanings. The first meaning is that within CEDAR, when Dr. Woodcock stood up the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, or OPQ, what was done was to bring all of the quality units within CEDAR into one office. So that's one of the meanings. But the other meaning, just as significant for us, is the One Quality Voice that comes together when we work with our colleagues. And those colleagues include two other organizations that we work very close with. One is the CEDAR organization, which is the Office of Compliance, as you would imagine. And the other one is the Office of Regulatory Affairs Pharma Program. So you bring those three groups together, and that becomes the one quality voice then to help us drive the vision and mission that we've put forward. So what is it that we do? 
Well, within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, we do assessments. We're moving away from the terminology of doing reviews because we do more than review applications. The applications come in. We're not just going to sit there and review it. We actually have to actively and constructively and creatively go through that application and review it and see if it meets the standards, the quality standards that we've set forth. So we call that assessment now, not, not um, uh, strictly review. We also do inspection. We get involved with the inspectorate, ORA, the Office of Regulatory Affairs. We do surveillance inspections. We want to surveil the industry. What are the trends? Where are the problems, quality problems, that need to be addressed to prevent shortages, to prevent problems with the uh, supply chain as we continue to get these drugs or try to get these drugs on the market. We also do research. You heard Cook talk about regulatory uh, research. We do the same thing as well. So within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, we do research to drive the regulations, to drive how we regulate within the industry itself. So everything that we do is geared towards the review of applications. And again, while generics are part of what we do, we also work on NDAs, VLAs. So I wanted to drive that, that, that point home. And then also we have on the top there policy. Because the work that we do, we need to put policy in place. So in order to better understand what it is we're doing, and to be able to have the industry understand what it is we're doing and how we do that, we need to establish the policies that we will follow to make it very transparent, very clear about what we're doing and how we're doing our day-to-day -day jobs. So all of this works to continue to go around in a circle because they feed each other going in that, in that circular fashion, if you will. Not that our reasoning is circular, but it does drive the um, uh, uh, circle of life, if you will, for OPQ. So in terms of our strategic priorities, it's a five-year strap plan. It's a little bit different than what you'll find in industry. Industry, usually you'll find strap plans that are by uh, R&D as well as commercial coming together, and you're usually driving around profits. Let's face it, government is not a profit, a for-profit organization, nor should it be. So our strap plans are a bit different. So what we've done is we've defined our strategic priorities for the next five years. So you have the strategic priorities that are laid out, and then the initiatives go underneath them drives our performance goals or metrics each year. So the strategy is the umbrella that should stay the same over the five years. It may need to be tweaked for various reasons, um, but the initiatives then underneath them will vary from year to year, and that's how we drive our objectives within the organization, and that's how we measure performance within the individuals within that organization. So the first one is to strengthen our collaborative organization itself. And the way we want to do that is to ensure efficient, high-performing, innovative and results-oriented organization. Yes, we are innovative the way we do work. We're innovative in the way we regulate the industry as well. But that provides or that gives us the opportunity then to allow for input and interaction with the industry, with academia, because we want to get that feedback as well as we define those policies. Also, we want to be able to promote availability of better medicines. So we want to minimize the barriers to innovation to encourage that going forward. So we need to be more proactive in doing that, and we need to be creative uh, in terms of how we regulate the um, uh, industry itself. So we want to have sensible oversight within the, of the industry. When we say sensible oversight, we don't want to be watching every single thing you do. We need to develop confidence and trust with the industry. You need to develop that confidence and trust with us. That we're going to do what we say and the way we say we're going to do it. So when we are able to develop that, you build that trust in there, and then we are able to have minimal oversight, hopefully. That's the ultimate goal of where we want to be, to have minimal oversight. So we can take those resources and use them to do the work that we need to continue to do going forward. We want to elevate awareness and commitment to the importance of pharmaceutical quality itself. So that becomes very important, and we need to do that through communication uh, of the importance of quality to the American public, so they can trust the drugs that they take. And then the fourth one, it's very simple. We have these four strategic priorities. is to strengthen partnerships and engage with our stakeholders. Those stakeholders are both internal to the FDA and just as importantly, external to the FDA. It could be with other regulatory agencies globally. It could be with the industry. It could be with, 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 with academia. So we do want to strengthen those collaborations going forward as well. So the other piece I want to get into, um, I'm not going to go through the organizational chart for OPQ. I just really want to highlight, you can go on our website or on the CEDAR website and look up the individual organizations. What I do want to highlight are some of the recent changes that we've had 
within my leadership team. This is the senior leadership team, or what I call the OPQ leadership team, or OPQLT. So the Office of Programs and Regulatory Operations, we now have an acting director in there, Mr. Don Henry. The person that you may have been familiar with that was running that group was Mr. Giuseppe Randazzo. Giuseppe has gone in and decided um, to, because uh, he, he's wanted to develop himself in other areas, to step into a role that was vacated to now uh, do a detail to head up the Office of New Drug Products. It's a nice development opportunity for him in that area. If you take a look all the way to the right, the Office of Process and Facilities, my Deputy Director, Dr. Lawrence Yu, who most of you know, um, has now stepped in to head up that group. Again, nice development opportunity for him to really help us, to help me drive the vision for that Office of Process and Facility. Office of Surveillance is now headed up by Dr. Uh, Cindy Busey. Uh, she moved over from the Office of Testing and Research. Again, nice development opportunity for her. New experience, new exposure. So that's left uh, open a vacancy in the Office of Testing and Research. And we've done two details. The person that's currently doing that detail is Dr. David Keary. So um, he's doing that as a development opportunity as well. And hopefully we'll be able to fill that office sometime before the end of the year with a permanent director. So in terms of Gadoofa 2, I want to go through some of the quality changes related to Gadoofa 2. And this is specific to the quality aspects of Gadoofa 2. So I'm not going to go through all the details or the specifics that Cook went through, but how it applies to us. Also, what I wanted to uh, point out is that at the end of the deck, I have some backup slides. You will also see some of the quality uh, uh, changes that are related to the other UFA programs, both PDUFA as well as PSUFA. I just wanted to include that for completeness. And I know some of you not only do generics, but you may also be involved in other areas with other application types. So within Gadoofa 2, all original ANDAs and ANDA amendments fall within a single assessment scheme. That scheme is shown on the right, plain and simple. That's what we need to follow. Those are the goals. And we need to hit a goal or a target of 90% of the, those uh, timings that are defined there. So it's nice because a lot of the things we're looking at are 90% or are our goals under Gadoofa 2. So the other part is we have creation of a new pre-ANDA program for complex uh, drug products. You'll hear about that more in discussions either later today or tomorrow. Since we like acronyms, we call this a pre-ANDA or what we like to call PANDA. So it's a nice way to remember that as you go forward. Um, and we focus in there on product development, pre-submission, mid-cycle meetings, for complex ANDAs. So this is something new now that's come up within Gadoofa 2. Restructuring of the user fee program to provide resources that are now commensurate with workload. So we're really trying to find out where the workload is now that we've had five years of experience under Gadoofa 1, figure out where those resources need to go. Are we adequately resourced at this point in time? The simple answer, the, the, the simplest answer is no. We are working to shift resources and reallocate resources, not only within OPQ, but across the entire PDUFA program to make sure that we do have uh, uh, the resources in the critical areas where they are needed. And then inclusion of elements to address small business concerns. This is SBIA, SB being the small business. So we want to also highlight the fact that there are some changes in GADUFA 2 that are very specific to small businesses. And you can see that listed uh, facility fees, tiers, as well as CMOs contract manufacturing organizations. So how, do we, um, how does OPQ want to strengthen its collaborative organization? Well, the way we plan on doing that, or one of the ways, and you've probably heard about this if you've um, uh, come to, to similar presentations, is something called IQA, which is the Integrated Quality Assessment. As the name implies, it's an integrated team or a team of subject matter experts, or SMEs, to perform quality assessment of an application. Nothing you know, magical about this. We just bring everybody together in one room at one time to really share uh, the, their questions and understandings and be able to try to expedite that review by having everybody in one room at one time. It consists of an application technical lead, what we call ATLs, again, all these acronyms. Uh, we have business partner process managers that actually manage the process within OPQ. So these are like your project managers, if you will. And we also have discipline reviewers, but it also includes ORA, or the Office of Regulatory Affairs. So we've, we've uh, brought in the inspectorate as we do our reviews. So we're doing review and inspection, hopefully at the same time, and addressing those questions within this integrated team. That's really uh, uh, to, save, uh, to be efficient 
and to save us time and to be able to answer those questions as a team as opposed to sitting in your office and doing it within a silo. And then these teams review and inspection functions are again brought together. So in terms of quality assessment enhancements, we've done some enhance enhancements to help us do our quality assessments. So we're always trying to do continual improvement. We are looking at innovation. So we want to develop tools to modernize the quality assessment as well as the knowledge management. And this knowledge management consists of what we learn with the RLD or the innovator product as well as within all of the ANDAs that we receive. Why do we want to do that? So that we have consistency in terms of identifying where the risk areas are for that product. So it starts with the innovator and then works all the way through uh, to the uh, uh, generic applicant. That's one of the reasons why we want to do that. The other reason why we want to be able to have a management, uh, a knowledge management system is so that we can uh, determine where those risk areas are and have consistency in terms of how we evaluate each individual application. So we do that more consistently and we focus on those areas across all of the applications that we will, re that we will receive as well. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to drive towards that. So we piloted a dashboard interface which was centered around, again, quality risks for CQAs or critical quality attributes. So we want to make sure we have that knowledge and know where to focus our time and attention. We look at control strategies for drug substance and drug product. It's those two pieces. We also have designed a computer-aided interface for life cycle uh, uh, knowledge management and standardization, as I mentioned before, of the ANDA quality assessment. So we're assessing each application, hopefully in a very similar, if not identical way, from uh, uh, application to application. So we have consistency in terms of how we're looking at those applications. We want to develop a benefit risk assessment framework that balances clinical content. It's key that we understand clinical content because, again, our focus is on patients and consumers. So if we're looking at risks, it's risks that, we're, that, that um, uh, would be of a concern in a clinical setting or to patients and consumers. That's where we really want to focus our time and attention. So when you start identifying or setting specifications, you can set them such that they are relevant to the patient or the consumer. So you just don't capriciously do, well, you know, look, Mike, I set all of these specifications. It shows I got a lot of control over the product. That may be true, and that's great. What, what's ultimately important to us is what's the clinical significance about those specifications. Again, tying it always back to the patient. In terms of our policy group itself, we've published seven maps. Maps are manuals of policies and procedures. Again, we've got all these acronyms. I don't necessarily want to get into all of that, but that's a rather significant number for our policy group. We responded to 220 external inquiries last year. So on top of doing these reviews, we get inquiries that continually come in. We need to respond to those. We also responded to uh, 527 controlled correspondences uh, that have come in. And as you can see by the asterisks, we did not miss any of those GDUFA dates, which is something that we're extremely proud of and providing that response back to the industry. We published 10 guidance documents. I'm not going to go through the uh, uh, documents themselves. Just want to let you know that we've, uh, you know, we have moved forward on publishing these guidances. So in terms of promoting availability of better medicines, how do we plan on doing that? How do we want to do that? Well, we have an emerging technology program. Some of you may have taken advantage of it. Uh, uh, we've had a number of companies uh, that have solicited uh, us to be part of this program. Some get accepted, some don't. There's standards that need to be met in order to get accepted into that program. But it supports industry's development and implementation of innovative approaches in pharmaceutical design, as well as in manufacturing. Manufacturing science needs to evolve from where it is today. Science, manufacturing science, the, the technology that is used is outdated. This technology has been around since post-World War II. We have a lot of quality issues with those uh, uh, processes. And in order to be able to minimize those uh, quality concerns, we really want to advocate for enhancements and innovation in pharmaceutical manufacturing. So we're looking at new ways to manufacture our products. For example, 3D printing, continuous manufacturing. These can really start to deal with and address some of those quality issues such that we get away from batch manufacture now and be able to really automate these systems with uh, a positive feedback controls uh, uh, instilled in them as well. 
on identifying and resolve potential scientific and policy issues related to these new approaches. So when you come into our program, we want to have a conversation with the uh, sponsor. And we want to say, look, where are the risks in this particular process so that we can have a better understanding, we as the, re as the assessors, as the regulators, so that when the application is actually submitted, we don't wait for those conversations to happen at that time. We proactively want to have them early on in the program so that you as a sponsor can address them when you submit your application. So when we receive that application, we already have a good understanding of what you've done and we have somewhat of an agreement um, in terms of how that is going to, to happen and how those issues are going to be addressed. Doing that has enabled the approval of the first switch from batch to continuous manufacturing for an approved drug. So we've actually had success in this by being able to now introduce new technology in a number of products that have been approved uh, recently. We have a website and guidance for the industry where this is posted. You can go on there learn more about the ETT program. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, diagram on the right of the slide, you'll see the policy that is set there or the guidance that's there, as well as the web page itself. And if you see the handsome young man that's in that uh, 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 clip, that is the person that gives you the introduction. So now while I heard some chuckles, all right, I, I admit maybe not young, but at least handsome um, individual, you'll be able to get a better understanding of what that ETT program is and be able to uh, take advantage of it if you, know, if, if you so choose. As Cook had mentioned, on the uh, OGD side, the Office of Generic Drugs, they also do research, they do science, regulatory science. We do the same things within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. These are the center of excellence that have been set up for us or that we've set up to be able to do that research. And it's a collaboration across CEDAR. So it's not only OPQ, it's not only OGD, but it's the offices, the relevant offices within CEDAR and even sometimes outside of CEDAR, looking at CBER, looking at the device uh, group, CDRH as well, that we want to pull in to help us do this research. And you can see the areas that we're focusing on are manufacturing science and innovation, pharmaceutical analytical analytics and uh, characterization. So we're looking at advanced analytics to look at some of these complex drugs, some of these complex drug products. So we really need to evolve. And the way to do that is to do the research. We have infectious disease and inflammation, tumor biology, and immunology. We do a lot of work on the BLA side, on the biologic side. So we need to do research in there as well. So these are centers of excellence that were set up because the need exists within the center be able to effectively review those applications. So elevate awareness and commitment to the importance of pharmaceutical quality. Well, how are you going to do that, Mike? What is OPQ going to be involved in? Well, one of the things that when, when applications come in, some companies uh, have put together what, what's called um, quality overall summaries. And as the name implies, it's a summary of the quality that's gone into or that you've addressed within that application. So what the applicant tries to communicate is that as they look at quality, they try to piece it all together to say, look, we've got a quality product. It's great. It's going to take you, Mike, you know, less time to review it because we've done all this work for you. Great. However, when we get some of those in, sometimes the quality of the quality overall summary is not all that great. So it is somewhat disjointed. So it was hard to follow or navigate through some of that uh, text that was written there and to follow the story that was being developed. So what we've done then is to publish a white paper in January of this year to describe key considerations when, when creating a quality, a quality overall summary. And that will really help us navigate through the application. It'll give the uh, sponsor the opportunity to kind of explain that in a more structured way, so in a, in a similar way from application to application, hence the reason why we published the white paper. It explains product and process development in a patient-focused context. Again. Everything needs to be patient-focused. So we really want to drive uh, home the point that when we look at these quality overall summaries, how does the quality relate to the uh, uh, ultimate consumer or the patient themselves? It effectively summarizes the overall control strategy. Do you have control over your process, over the product, over the development of that product? So we don't want to just take your word for it. You need to walk us through it. So it does provide a nice roadmap for that as well. It guides the, regula uh, the regulator through the submission itself. So it's your opportunity to guide us, walk us through your application and how you develop that product. So it's a nice way to showcase all the work that you've done. Many generic applications have effectively used a QOS, and it was based on question-based review, QBR. 
and people have had success in doing that, and you can continue to do that moving forward uh, uh, as you do your as you put your applications together. We have our annual report. Our annual report is outside. If uh, it's on one side of the table, that's out in the front there. I do encourage you to take a copy of that. We put a lot of time and effort into that, and it highlights our major accomplishments in the five areas that I mentioned earlier: assessment, inspection, surveillance, policy, and research. Give you a little more detail than what I've highlighted here today. It crosses all human drug user fee programs. Again, PDUFA, PSUFA, as well as PDUFA. So the three programs that we're working in. It communicates the importance of quality and shares the message that the American public can trust their drugs with the work that we do. That's the intent and the work that you do uh, as well. And then it highlights the approval or tentative approval of a record, a record, almost 1,100 uh, uh, generic applications we had to go through this year. That's an amazing amount of work. And that's only a piece of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in conjunction with other offices, OGD, um, you know, Office of Compliance, the Inspectorate, and things along those lines. But if you could imagine, you take that, put on top of that the work we do on NDAs and BLAs, it's a phenomenal amount of work. And the only way we get through that is because we have an awesome organization of dedicated and strongly trained individuals that do the review, do the assessment, do the surveillance, and that work with us to be able to get that work done. Strengthening partnerships and engaging uh, shareholders or stakeholders. These are some of the organizations we engage with. I'm not going to go through the list here. You can read that on your own. But the point is that we engage with a lot of external organizations in order to get our message across, to be able to hear the industry's point of view, and to be able to have those uh, uh, effective discussions. Um, in terms of engaging with stakeholders, we work with USP. You heard Cook mention the same thing. We had 135 uh, liaisons to USP, expert committees and expert panels. Again, all this takes time and prep work. The um, international collaborations, we've gone to foreign regulatory agencies that are out there in Australia, Japan, Europe, Canada, to work with them to understand their best practices in terms of how they do their regulatory work, share with them how we do our regulatory work, and learn from each other. So it's an ongoing exchange of information. So we actually spend time with each other a week, at, you, typically a week, we're there to learn what each other is doing. We work with PICS, the Pharmaceutical Inspection uh, Cooperation Scheme. So we work with them, as you can imagine, because we do inspection, pre-approval, post-approval, um, things along those lines. So we want to harmonize inspections and, and share that quality information. We are hosting this year the PICS annual seminar in Chicago in September. So again, we do sometimes do these joint uh, uh, conferences. We work with ICH on Q12M9. Again, I'm not going to go into the details around those, but we do work with uh, ICH to be able to globalize and harmonize the way we do our work and the way we regulate that. Mutual recognition uh, agreement. We are now have 12 member states that are now recognized that if they do an inspection, we will recognize their inspection. If we do an inspection, they will recognize ours. So what does that do? It prevents us or them from actually having to go out there and do the inspection ourselves. So we trust each other. We have a mutual uh, reliance on each other to do those inspections, and we accept those inspections. We also have concept of operations for facility evaluation inspections. This is a collaboration amongst ORA, OC, and uh, OPQ, as I mentioned before, the One Quality Voice. It outlines the workflow for pre-approval, post-approval surveillance, and four-cause inspe inspections. So we didn't want to step on each other's toes, so we really had to define who's responsible, who takes the lead, who do we communicate with, how do we really uh, coordinate those inspections. CEDAR and ORA began implementation of the CONOPS in fall of last year. You can see the commissioner's tweet on the right-hand side. He was very proud of the work that these three offices actually did uh, to the point where he wanted to tweet about it. And it includes a commitment to communicate surveillance inspection classification to facility owners within 90 days. There's this magical number of 90 uh, that comes through in GDUFA 2 uh, at the end of the inspection, and we have a goal of 90%. So um, it's easy enough to remember. Uh, ongoing updates to related documents needed to be done. These are all the documents that we have to update. So there was a lot of work that went into doing this, but something we're very proud of because it actually defines um, how we're going to do facility evaluations and how we're going to inspect those facilities going forward and who does what defined in a very clear and concise way. Engaging stakeholders on quality. Many establishments use quality metrics. Yes, I've seen some, some of the uh, 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 trade press that says quality metrics 
what's going on with quality metrics, haven't heard much about it. Well, because we're still working with the industry to get feedback on that. When we originally went forward or moved forward with this, as you could imagine, as some of you may have even been involved in, we got a lot of feedback from the industry. So we had to take a step back since we got such an overwhelming amount of response from the industry. We really needed to work through all of that and to determine uh, what direction we wanted to move forward with. But quality metrics, trust me, is alive and well. Um, we are moving and continue to move that forward. It is one of the things that is a priority for me, for OPQ, um, and for the uh, center itself. But we're at the immature stage right now. It's a minimal program, so we, have, uh, we get uh, minimal information which is coming to us through these annual reports. Uh, we look through them and pull out whatever information we can to be able to uh, look at the quality of the industry itself. Uh, we react to existing problems, so we're not being proactive in this area. This is where we are right now, so I, I don't want you to think this is where we're going to end up. Um, it's only general and non-specific metrics. Uh, that's one of the other parts that, that we've had some discussion around about redefining some of the metrics. And then we've had, um, on the mature side, predictive analytics. We want to be in a place where we then have analytics that are leading indicators of what could potentially be quality issues within the industry itself. So we want to be able to predict where the problems are going to be so we can address those problems before they become bigger problems and create things like drug shortages, recalls. So if we can do that, that would be a big help, again, to serve the public, to, conserve, uh, um, to serve consumers as well as patients. So that's really what we're trying to do here. We want to have thoughtful metric selection. So we're looking back, uh, working with some academic uh, associations to be able to figure out what are those predictive um, uh, metrics that we may want to uh, move towards. Assess quality culture and overall commitment to quality. We want to be able to see how do you assess quality culture. You go into a company, you do an inspection. They have a quality culture. How do you know that? What do you look for? There are ways to do that, and we're learning more and more about that through some of the other industry organizations and through some academic societies as well, because we want to be able to get a handle on that. It starts with things like senior management and staff committed to overall quality. It's got to start from the top, but it's got to be driven down quality throughout the entire organization itself. So you can't just expect it to happen on its own. You can't just say, we're doing quality, and everybody's going to be you know, doing a quality job. It doesn't work that way. You really have to drive this through the industry through the companies. I mean, continual improvement of product and process, the pharmaceutical quality system, the metrics program. So we want to do continual improvements, as we have mentioned before. It's part of what we do, part of what we need to do as the industry continues to grow and evolve. So it is not a stagnant process or a stagnant system. So why are these metrics important to the FDA? really wanted to stress this because I think there's some confusion as to why we're doing this. FDA, CGMP for drugs require manufacturers to have an ongoing quality program. It's one of the reasons. So you need to really be driving quality through your organization to maintain and elevate product and process dated, uh, data related to product quality. Who doesn't want to have a quality organization? I mean, it seems like an obvious, uh, uh, the answer seems to be obvious, but it's not. Some of the things we see, I've got to tell you, some of the things I've seen, some of the inspection reports I've looked at, it's amazing what people don't do. So we've really got to try to drive that. So there's that common denominator of these, these poor performers that are really driving us to uh, put this uh, program into place and to drive it forward. Facility continual improvement and the expiration, or sorry, the expectations of ICHQ-10 need to be realized. Uh, uh, requires measurements of quality indicators, so we need to be true to that um, uh, ICHQ-10 guidance. And then also provide quantitative and objective insight. So we need to measure it, and it needs to be objective. So I want folks coming back and saying, oh, you know what, this is so subjective. Um, you know, you, you guys are just making this stuff up as you're going along. So we need to measure it, and we want to be um, objective in terms of uh, uh, what that data is telling us for the quality of product in the facility. So we want to enhance risk-based surveillance inspections so we know when to go out to companies. Companies that have better quality systems, that are in good state of quality, we don't have to come out there and inspect you all that often. Why should we? Saves us time, saves you as a company time, so why not be a strong, uh, have a good, strong quality system in place, have that quality culture throughout the organization so we don't have to come and inspect you all the time, or as frequently as we may. Improve uh, effectiveness of inspections. 
we need to know where the quality risks are. That's where we want to focus our inspections. We don't want to come in and just do all these general inspections. We need to focus our time and attention on where we need to go. Help to identify factors leading to supply disruptions. This is a big concern to us. There are a lot of drugs that are in shortage, and we scramble around trying to figure out how to continue providing those drugs to the American public or to the public at large. And it becomes a, a very uh, um, uh, a tough issue sometimes to be able to deal with. And then obviously the, the uh, patient or consumer is the one that ultimately suffers. But if we can identify quality issues that prevents recalls, that prevents these drug shortages, then we'd be in better state to continue that supply of drugs to the patients. So the draft guidance, we looked at three areas, robustness of commercial manufacturing, uh, robustness of laboratory operations, and the voice of the uh, patient and consumer as well. And we had our three metrics that were defined there when we originally put this program together. Uh, the portal has not been opened up yet because, again, we're taking a step back. We've gotten some strong uh, feedback from the industry, and we're trying to figure out how best to deal with that. But well, we are continuing to work through that, and we will continue to uh, move this program forward. So it remains important to us um, an, an expectation of modern manufacturing. So therefore, we encourage firms to refine an existing program you may have, quality program within your company, or initiate a new program as an important step toward building this quality culture. Also, we want to understand industry concerns and suggestions to move the program forward. So if you still have not provided feedback, you can go to this uh, a mailbox and send your concerns in. And then the portal development is near completion. And what we want to do is we want to have companies provide us with dummy data, not real data, just dummy data, to run it through the portal, run water through the pipes, if you will, to make sure the system actually works. So again, we're still moving forward on putting that portal together. There's more to come in the future, so please stay tuned to that. In terms of a conclusion, again, our four priorities for OPQ. I can summarize them, in, uh, summarize them in four words. First one is collaboration, innovation, communication, and engagement. Those are the four areas that we as OPQ are driving towards. And again, they're defined in these four strategic priorities. So we all have a shared responsibility with the focus on patients. Uh, with that focus on patients, together we can provide confidence in the next dose and ensure the safety and efficacy of the next dose that the consumer takes. So with that in mind, I just want to take the, the opportunity to thank SBIA um, as well as OGD for inviting me and, and uh, my organization, OPQ, to partake in this conference. Uh, enjoy it over the next couple of days. And um, that's it. I leave it at that. So thanks again.